graduated from MIT and University of Toulouse, uh, where he got his PhD. His main research focuses on bio-inspired artificial intelligence, mainly genetic programming, neural networks, and the evolution of learning. He will be giving a class about introduction to deep learning this afternoon. Dennis, we're thrilled to have you on board. You have the floor. Thanks for the nice introduction, Emmanuel. So um, as Emmanuel said, I'm going to be talking about deep learning today. Uh, I don't need to introduce myself much more because Emmanuel pretty much already did it. Uh, uh, but I'd like to get to know all of you a bit more, uh, those of you who are uh, participating in the RLVS today for this session. Uh, so I'll be using a tool throughout the, um, the class today to get feedback from you all. And I would really appreciate it uh, if you could go to ahaslides.com slash, uh, slash deep intro. Uh, I see 85 of you are already there. That's great. Uh, and we'll get started right away with some of the questions. So when you hear uh, deep learning, uh, what does that make you think of? This is uh, an open question. There's no wrong response. Definitely neural networks are a central theme that we're going to be talking a lot about today. Um, personally, from a research background, that's where a lot of my interests in deep learning come from. Uh, I look at bio-inspired forms of artificial intelligence, uh, including evolutionary algorithms and learning in the brain. And so I'm inspired by how learning happens biologically uh, and try to apply that in deep neural networks. We're going to talk a lot about biological uh, neurons at the beginning of the class today, but then get more into the, the theoretical side. I see a few other things in here. Uh, function, uh, function approximator, we're going to talk about function approximation quite a bit today. There are some things in here that we're not going to have the time to talk about today uh, because the scope of this class is going to try to be in the, the framework of the reinforcement learning uh, school. Uh, so while some things like function approximation are very useful, other things like large convolutional architectures used for object detection and computer vision are not as uh, pertinent for this class. And so we're not going to, to go over those topics today. Um, but uh, I have uh, the website for today's class, uh, which I believe you all have the link for. I'll go ahead and share that in the Zoom as well. Um, and you can find all of the class materials there, but also supplementary material. If there's any part of deep learning that you feel you'd like to go uh, uh, further in on and that we didn't have time to go over today because two hours is, is a very short time to talk about all of deep learning. So thanks for all of those awesome answers for the first question. I'd like to get to know how, uh, how, how much you all already know deep learning. Are there experts uh, who are watching today? Are there uh, people who have never done deep learning at all? Uh, where are we in terms of the, the now 200 of you who are responding uh, to the questions here, which is great. Thanks for, um, thanks for being so active on the AHA slides. So this is great. Uh, we have uh, mostly people who um, are somewhere somewhere in the middle. Uh, I did gear today's session uh, for people who had never done deep learning before, uh, but I will use some concepts that are in supervised learning, uh, machine learning, and certainly there's going to be a big base in Python and NumPy uh, that if, uh, if you're unfamiliar with Python and NumPy, today might be a little bit fast but hopefully um, those things will come uh, uh, if you look over the material again later. So I think this is a perfect place to be right in the middle. Uh, and if you're an expert, I hope that there's something that I can 
add in uh, that, that you're unaware of, but this is a class that's meant to be introductory for deep learning. Uh, so let's move on to the next question, uh, which is the deep learning frameworks that you've already used. We'll see exactly why deep learning as a domain requires uh, specialized tools in terms of uh, programming languages and, and programming frameworks. Uh, and the one that we're going to be using in the class today is called PyTorch, which is currently in a war with TensorFlow for, uh, for first place, switching between the two of them quite a bit. Uh, there are some other options that you might see on your screen uh, that maybe uh, you haven't heard of. Uh, I recommend looking around. I'm sorry that Flux appears twice. Uh, it, it is a personal bias that it's in there, but it's not a personal bias that it's in there twice. That's just a mistake. Um, but the, uh, the other frameworks, uh, such as DL4J, uh, Chainer, these are frameworks that aren't as well known as PyTorch uh, and TensorFlow, which are the big two frameworks of deep learning, uh, but are interesting to look at and, and see what, you know, advantages those bring. So I'm glad to see that so many of you have used PyTorch. That's what we're going to be using today. Uh, so hopefully things will go pretty easily for those of you who are already experts in PyTorch. Uh, however, I hope that there aren't too many things that are just uh, redundant with, uh, with what you've done before. Uh, so that's it for the introductory questions. Thanks so much uh, for that. We're going to pass now to the first notebook. Uh, so I've put collab, uh, Google Collab links for all of these notebooks, which uh, will just work right away if you, uh, if you open those up. Uh, it might take a, a second to load, but you shouldn't have too many problems running the notebooks from inside of Collab. Uh, of course, you can download the notebooks locally. Uh, and the main uh, thing that you'll need to install is PyTorch, uh, but we'll also be using sklearn, numpy, matplotlib, and at one point, network x uh, just for visualization. So if you don't have that, that's not the end of the world. Uh, so without further ado, let's dive in. So, uh, Artificial neural networks are the base of deep learning. And these networks are, are uh, themselves based on or inspired by uh, biological neural networks. So in order to understand deep learning, even if parts of deep learning are now far from the, the functionality of the brain, uh, some things are not uh, bioplausible in, in terms of algorithms, it's still very important, I think, to understand where this inspiration comes from, uh, why we use the base components that we use. And we'll, we'll be talking about individual neurons uh, for a good amount of time, uh, individual artificial neurons. So let's start with individual biological neurons. So biological neurons have a uh, central cell body, which is called the soma. And the soma, is the uh, main point that's going to bring in all sorts of information coming from the dendrites of the neuron. So dendrites will surround the soma uh, and collect information coming from other neurons. As soon as the uh, as soon as a threshold is reached in terms of uh, signal sent to the neuron, the neuron will uh, discharge its signal down an axon, uh, carrying an electrical impulse away from the cell body to axon terminals, which will then be connected to dendrites from other neurons. Uh, this is a picture of neuron functionality that isn't all encompassing. There are other types of neurons in the brain uh, this idea of functionality is, is uh, uh, largely based on, uh, uh, or, or the, the most similar to the uh, functionality of pyramidal neurons uh, in the cerebral cortex. And those are important neurons for understanding uh, human cognition because they're the most numerous type of neuron in the, the cerebral cortex, which is where a lot of uh, 
high level cognition happens, a lot of sensory information gets passed. Uh, it's, it's very important part of the brain for what we consider to be thinking. So while there are other types of neurons that transmit information differently, such as dopaminergic neurons, uh, we're going to focus on this model of electrical impulses uh, sending out to other neurons that are downstream and connecting together in a, in a wired network. Uh, so what we see here is, is images of uh, or, or depictions of what actual pyramidal neurons in the cerebral cortex look like, uh, not exactly as neat as the um, as the little diagram that we have here, but we have the, the basic same idea of somas, uh, the dendritic uh, tree here, the, uh, the axon leading away uh, from the soma, and all of the different axon terminals that it has. So there is this important paradigm of input parts and an output uh, part to the neuron that is going to be conserved when we talk about artificial models. So ever since humans have understood uh, that neurons exist as cells and, and have been able to measure their, um, uh, their activity, which is now about uh, almost a century old in terms of information, uh, we've been trying to model them because if the human brain can process information efficiently, uh, can we design artificial computing methods that mimic that functionality? And even before we had computers that are uh, of the, the same form as, as what we have right now, there were already thoughts about how do we replicate the activity of neurons and the activity of the brain inside of a computer, inside of a thinking machine. So let's take an individual neuron, the idea of a cell, and make a very simplified version of it, where we're going to be receiving just binary information. We can collapse the entire uh, uh, idea of multiple dendrites receiving different uh, impulses, and we just want to have from different connections a binary piece of information. That could represent, for example, this impulse that the neurons send away from the uh, cell body, a spike, uh, which is to say one of the other neurons might have spiked to tell this neuron it's raining or I have an umbrella uh, or some, uh, some type of binary information like that. Uh, we're going to model whether or not our neuron activates fires uh, using a function called the heavy side step function. So it's going to be zero uh, if the weighted sum uh, plus a bias term of all of our inputs is less than zero. So we haven't arrived at the threshold necessary to send a signal out. However, if we do surpass that threshold, then we're going to send a one. Uh, that can also be written just as, as step. Uh, and the basic principle is if there's enough positive information coming in, that individual neuron is going to also fire and pass positive information down the line. That model is known as the perceptron, uh, and it was introduced in the 1950s. There's an algorithm for training the perceptron uh, that goes along with it that we're not going to get into today. Uh, we're just going to talk about the model of the perceptron as a neuron, which is to say an individual neuron uh, that has the heavy side step function. So if we use this model, uh, we can actually construct logic gates. Uh, so uh, I hope some of you have done binary logic before, uh, but uh, we're going to represent binary values with zeros and ones, and we're going to do simple logic operations with them being and, or, nand, and eventually XOR. Uh, so let's define a function for our perceptron that takes in weights, uh, bias, the, the bias term, and inputs. All of that it will do is return the dot product of the inputs and the weights, 
add the bias term and apply the heavy side function that we discussed before, so the step function. The, uh, what, what I would like you to, to think about, uh, although we'll have the answer in just a second, is uh, what are weights and biases that correspond to AND or, or NAND gates? Can we construct an AND gate for an arbitrary set of binary inputs just by having a specific set of weights? And the same question for OR and NAND gates. So the response is, is yes. <laughs> That's uh, uh, one of the main uh, selling points of this uh, model is that we can construct binary circuits using a different set of combination of weights. So it's a somewhat universal uh, module that allows, if we have different parameterization of that module, to replicate it and to have uh, different logic gates depending just on the uh, parameters. So we can see an example of that. Uh, for example, if we have two, two, and minus one uh, as the weights and bias, then what the uh, gate will do is the OR function. So we have all of our inputs here. And OR is going to be if either of these are a one, we should get a one. And that is what we get at out of our um, perceptrons. So those weights uh, were successfully doing the OR function. If we change the two and two to one and one, we'll actually get an AND function. So we can try that. Uh, and yes, we see that, okay, this is zero. Uh, so we should get a zero. And also for these, which previously were giving a one, now they no longer surpass the threshold necessary when we do this weighted sum because we've changed the weights from two to one. Uh, and so instead of getting uh, ones here as the output, we get zeros, which is the uh, behavior of the AND gate. A slightly more complicated one is the NAND gate, which should do uh, anything except for AND. And that is what we see. So this is not and, uh, this is not uh, both values being true. Uh, none of these are until this last one. And that is where our gate gives a zero. So with, just by changing the weights uh, from simple values, we can create different types of logic gates using the same model. To give a little bit of a historical perspective, but not to go completely into the details of, of it, uh, a, a thought exercise is how can we construct an XOR gate? So an exclusive OR, uh, which is uh, similar to the NAND. Uh, we want only the combinations that are OR. Uh, we do not want the AND. Well, um, as it turns out, you can't create an XOR with a single perceptron. Uh, perceptrons implement a linear combination of their inputs, and so they can only separate classes that are linearly separable. Uh, XOR is non-linearly separable, and so we can't, with a single perceptron, construct an XOR. This was the subject or, or one of the points made in a book about perceptrons uh, by Marvin Minsky in 1968. So uh, a while after the, um, the, the publication of the perceptron algorithm. Uh, and it was a, a central criticism in, uh, in what, was, what can be seen as the first AI winter. So to, to give a little bit of the historical perspective on, on why this question is important. Uh, but it also leads us nicely into this idea of needing multiple layers of neurons, because if we add different logic gates together, uh, one after the other, and we aren't limited by this constraint to just have a single perceptron, then we can actually create the XOR function. Uh, we can, for example, say that XOR is 
uh, x1 or x2 and x1 NAND x2. We'll see a diagram of that. Uh, so we have XO connecting to NAND and to OR, X1 connecting to OR and to NAND as well. So the OR will do OR of XO, X1, and that will feed into AND. The NAND will do the same thing. Doing this chain of operations gives you an XOR. And of course, that was known at the time. Uh, the, the problem was simply that uh, it was difficult to train uh, or, or uh, yeah, difficult to train uh, a network uh, that had multiple layers, which is the, the whole type of network that we will look at today. Uh, so let's build a uh, XOR gate. I'm going to use slightly different weight values here, uh, but they're also weight values that work to construct these different types of gates. So uh, here I'm using three as the bias instead of uh, ones as before. But as you can see, that uh, that does implement the NAND and AND gates. Uh, and we can see in the output values that this does effectively do uh, ones only when there is an OR and then a zero when uh, both inputs are positive. And so that is an XOR gate. Uh, and we can verify it against the numpy uh, logical XOR function, uh, which also gives us you know, false, true, true, false. So we've made an XOR. Uh, uh, the only thing to do it was that we had to uh, go from having a single perceptron to having multiple layers of perceptrons. Uh, and that is what we're going to call a multi-layer perceptron. So if we have this uh, uh, weighted sum with a heavy side step function unit inside of a graph, and we have multiple layers of that, we can call it a multi-layer perceptron. At this point, we can also call it an artificial neural network. It's a pretty good conclusion because we can represent any logical circuit as a uh, multi-layer perceptron. The problem is, how do we find the structure and the weights necessary to construct the circuit that we want uh, for our needs? That's what we're going to do in the next notebook. Uh, but first, we're going to stay a little while on this idea of artificial neural networks beyond multi-layer perceptrons. And in doing that, we're going to talk about the universal approximation theory with artificial neural networks. So the, the perceptron uses this heavy side step function, which uh, is a binary function and is made to take in binary inputs. Uh, binary inputs aren't always the most useful way to, to process information. It is certainly how spikes uh, work if, if you represent them in a non-temporal domain. Uh, but spikes in the brain can also encode continuous information. Uh, so in, instead of doing non-temporal uh, binary values for all of our artificial neural network, in a computer, you can represent floating values, why not use floating values as our inputs uh, and outputs of the, the network? That would allow us to represent information that's a lot more fluid uh, and could be more useful. Uh, so instead of using a steep function like the heavy side function, which only gives uh, zeros and ones as outputs, we're going to use something softer. And specifically, we're going to use the sigmoid function, which you can see here. So let's define that in Python and let's plot it. So this is what the sigmoid function looks like. I assume most of you have, have already seen this before um, and uh, it has a similar shape to the, uh, uh, to the heavy side step function uh, in that it, it gives zero and one at its limits, uh, but at its base, it gives uh, uh, continuous values in between zero and one. Something important to notice though, is that if its inputs 
based on weights have different values, which we could represent here as Wx plus V. Well, then the form of this is going to change. We could, for example, imagine a weight of 100 and let's just keep the bias at zero for now. Suddenly, the sigmoid looks a lot more like the heavy side step function. Uh, it uh, goes almost directly up from zero to, to one, whereas before uh, it was much smoother and seemed much more continuous. It still is continuous, it's just got this very steep curve. Uh, I'm gonna let numpy not overflow and move that down to 50, uh, which gives us still this, this form. Uh, but what we can do is also translate it over. Uh, so here we translated it from being centered at zero back over uh, to, uh, uh, to almost minus 2.5. So based on the weights and the biases of our network, the, the same parameters that we had for our um, uh, perceptron, we're going to be able to change the behavior of this sigmoid function. And that's exactly what we're going to do now to, to talk about universal approximation. Just to note that there are many other activation functions used in modern artificial neural networks. We'll get back to these in the third notebook. Um, uh, specifically, we'll look at the rectified linear unit. Uh, but today we're going, uh, in this first part, we're going to stick with the uh, sigmoid function. The property that this allows us to show uh, is that in general, uh, and, and this is the uh, non-technical version of the, the theorem, uh, a neural network can approximate any continuous function. There are constraints on that, um, and we're going to not look at individual proofs of uh, a single layer sigmoid neural network. Uh, we're instead going to look at an illustrative example, but I recommend if anyone's interested in going and looking at the various uh, universal approximation theorem proofs that show for different neural network types their capacity to approximate any function. So we're going to use a neural network with just two neurons and one input and one output. Uh, so like I said, we, we could have called this a multi-layer perceptron. These are going to have a sigmoid activation. And so it's more correct to think of it now as an artificial neural network. Uh, I, I've seen a few of you raise your hands. I'll just uh, make a quick note that I am looking at the questions in the Q&A. Uh, and so if you have any questions, feel free to use that as a way to, to ask your question. That's a little bit more uh, easy for me to, 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 to deal with since there are 500 of you. Uh, so let's define this neural network. Uh, we've got the two nodes here uh, and we'll apply the sigmoid function to them. Uh, we're going to be multiplying our inputs uh, by the weights. We're doing a, uh, the transpose of the weights so that they line up correctly for this dot product. Uh, and then we're adding our biases. Uh, this is the, the first set of weights and biases. And then for the second uh, output layer, we've got the second set of weights and biases that we will be uh, sending out from our ANN. So here uh, we are going to define some weights and biases. These aren't, uh, these. I, I chose these to, to get a, a specific form. Uh, and if we change it, we can actually change how this form looks. The thing to note right now is that we have this nice little bump uh, and we'll, we'll use this bump later, but if we change uh, any of the weights, for example, changing the weights like this, it changes completely the form of the network, uh, of the, the activation of our final layer. So, so how the output looks for different types of inputs. Uh, but let's concentrate on, on the fact that we can create a bump by sort of canceling out two different sigmoids. 
by adding more neurons, uh, since we canceled uh, the tail ends of two sigmoids, we, we could just add more neurons to cancel the tail ends of, of even more sigmoids uh, and add in a second bump. Uh, so here, here we have a second bump that we created by adding in uh, two more neurons. And we can translate that bump. We can move it around. Uh, so I, I moved it, I, I made it a little bit wider. We could also move it uh, much closer to the, to the other bump. Uh, and we're moving these bumps around uh, in our final function output just by changing the parameters of our neural network. And that's an important point to remember that you know, just by changing these, uh, these values here, uh, we're able to change the form of what our function uh, looks like, the function being what the neural network is approximating. By adding more and more neurons, what we could do is have a target function that we are uh, that that we are trying to approximate, uh, and we just keep adding more until we have a good amount of neurons. So there's a, a good question, which is uh, how many layers or neurons do you need in order to get the the universal uh, approximation property? Uh, if you have a sigmoid activation, you only need one layer. There are also proofs for two layer, uh, uh, and, and that I encourage you to, to, to explore. In terms of the number of neurons, uh, it isn't that you need a specific number. It depends on the, uh, the function that you're trying to approximate. It's just that there is a network. If we can keep adding neurons, that will approximate that function. Uh, so we assume that the upper bound on the number of neurons that we could have in our first layer is infinite, uh, but it depends on the, the approximation and the level of approximation that you're trying to achieve. Here, we're not approximating sign very well, uh, but we are getting somewhat the form of sign. And that, again, is simply by changing what the parameters are. For example, if I move the first bump over, uh, our approximation doesn't do nearly as well anymore. I could move it back a little bit too far. And again, it's not doing very well. It was much better when the bias was at 40. Well, maybe 37 would be even better. Yeah, that looks good. So uh, this is eight neurons now. We, we increased to have even more bumps, but uh, I hope this visual proof has helped you understand how a neural network could approximate any sort of uh, function. Uh, this, um, this demonstration was uh, inspired by one in the deep neural, the neural networks and deep uh, learning online book, which I encourage you to read if, if you want to know more about the universal approximation uh, theorem. Uh, and here you can actually modify the values of the bars in a nice JavaScript toggle. So feel free to uh, look at that. Yes, there are studies uh, about uh, function complexity and, and the number of neurons, yes. Uh, so uh, we can keep adding neurons uh, to make our, our network uh, wider uh, and wider and wider and wider. However, as we'll see uh, in terms of deep learning architectures, that is not how most deep learning uh, ANNs are structured. Uh, in, instead of adding more neurons to a single layer, we're actually going to make the network deeper and deeper. Uh, but in order to do that, we need an important tool called backpropagation, which we'll see next. Uh, and uh, so uh, that isn't to suggest that you know the solution should always be add, add a wider network to approximate your function better. It's simply that a single layer of neurons can, with enough neurons, uh, approximate any continuous function. <laughs> 
Uh, one last note uh, on this notebook, uh, which is about propagating values through a network. So I want to I want us to to take a little bit of time to see how we can do that in terms of code. We've already seen a little bit uh, of what that looks like, but let's construct a network that has two input neurons, uh, four uh, neurons in the first layer, uh, three neurons in the second hidden layer, and a single output neuron with uh, which has an identity activation function. So the all of the hidden neurons, uh, the ones in inside the network, are going to be sigmoid neurons, but the one at the very end is going to be an identity neuron. We're going to start this network uh, with random weights, uh, and all of the networks that we've had uh, before, we're going to, uh, we, we've been choosing the weights that we use, now we're going to do them randomly, and we're going to specifically use a normal distribution uh, around zero with a standard deviation of one for the weights of our network. So here are all of the, the weights uh, between the inputs in the first layer, between the first layer and the second layer, between the second layer and the output layer. And here are all of the biases. They're just uh, normal, uh, normally distributed numbers around zero. And the initialization of networks uh, is a really important parameter. Uh, there have been different types of initializations proposed uh, for deeper neural networks, because of course the, uh, the initial weights are going to inform how we can train the network uh, later on. So uh, here's the forward pass that we're going to be using, at least for right now. Let's walk through this a little bit. So we have uh, the input information to our network, uh, and then we have the weights and the biases. Uh, we're also going to give a verbose flag so that we can see different output if we if we like. We're going to start a memory buffer of the activations at each of our layers uh, so that as we go through the network, we save the activations. And we're going to start that just by copying the input. So uh, here we go through the different layers of our network. Uh, printing out if we're at a certain layer. And then this is where the main part of the network computation happens. And it's exactly the same formula that we saw before. Uh, it's Wx uh, plus b. Uh, and uh, the activation part comes in in these lines. So uh, if you remember, we had a final neuron, which is an identity function activation, uh, and then the other ones are sigmoids. So if we're at the final layer, uh, then we have just the input. And then if we are not at the final layer, we'll be using the sigmoid activation function. Finally, we're going to return the uh, buffer of all of the activations as the result of our forward pass. That's a little bit more information than you might need, because you might just need the activation of the final neuron uh, to compare it with you know, the, the value that you were hoping for for your function approximation. Uh, but here we're going to store everything so that we can look at it in better detail. So. Um, this is uh, the, the application of that to inputs of 0 and 1. So we can see the values propagating through the network uh, in a forward pass. So first we uh, get the activations, uh, the, the inputs from for the first layer in terms of Wx plus b. And then we have all of the outputs, which are the sigmoid of those values. Uh, then we move to the second layer, which has three neurons. Finally, the output layer. So a few properties of our neural network that I want to go over. Uh, if we call this multiple times, the answer is always the same. We don't have any sort of internal state in this neural network. It is a feed forward 
neural network. Uh, there are other types of neural network called recurrent neural networks, which will change every time you call them. But this is a feed-forward neural network. It is what we can call idempotent. Uh, it only uh, it gives the same answer every time you call it. It's also deterministic. Doesn't have any sort of stochastic part to it. The stochasticity came in the initialization. If we change the initialization, now we have new weights and biases. Then when we run the same input through our network, we're going to have a different response. And so that's the training of the weights, uh, which we'll talk about next. How do we look for weights and biases that get us to a specific function that we want to approximate? Uh, so that is what we're doing next. But before that, I want to respond to a few of the questions uh, and get your uh, responses on some of my questions. Uh, so please uh, go, go back to the AHA slides uh, tab wherever you have that. Uh, in the meantime, I'll answer to the question about discriminating in between adding more neurons or adding more layers. As we'll see, uh, mostly in the fourth notebook, different layers in modern uh, uh, deep neural networks have different purposes, uh, specifically convolutional neural uh, layers and max pooling layers have a different purpose than these fully connected layers. So if you're just trying to uh, approximate a single function, it is a harder question to, to answer. Uh, do, do you make it, do you add a third layer of the same size? Do you just make your, your uh, layers much wider? Um, but in most applications of deep learning, you have a specific objective in mind that's going to require, at this point, we need more convolutional layers. At this point, we need to reduce in the size. So uh, it's useful to think of layers as sort of building blocks that we can, we can put together. Uh, so for a linear approximation, uh, we could, yeah, just use uh, one layer uh, that, and, and a single neuron. That would, that would suffice if we had a fully linear problem that we want to, um, uh, that we want to approximate. Uh, like I, uh, like, so in terms of the number of layers for a function approximation, uh, the universal approximation theorem shows that a single one is sufficient. Uh, however, we usually use two, uh, and we'll get into why it might be better to go deeper in the next notebook, uh, because even if you can approximate any function, it's not necessarily easy to make your weights and biases arrive at the point where you're approximating that function. Uh, start the quiz. Okay, uh, which logical function can a single perceptron implement? So you can answer, you can respond to more than one of these if you want. The timing on these is pretty fast. So try to get your answers in. Great, so a single perceptron cannot implement XOR, but it can implement all of these other ones. Uh, fewer answers on NOR because we didn't see it, uh, but it is one of the things that a perceptron can implement, uh, a single perceptron. Uh, second question. If you multiply all the weights and biases of a perceptron by a constant, does the logical function change? So if you had a gate that is doing and, and you multiply everything by three, are you still doing and? So the logical function does not change. Uh, you're still doing and. If you're multiplying all of the weights and biases by the same constant, uh, the heavy side step function is weight, in, or, or more so the perceptron is weight invariant. 
So a forward pass through a feed forward neural network with sigmoid activation functions is, and here again, you can answer any of these, uh, multiple of them if, if you want. Great, so the only one that maybe isn't very clear is idempotent. What that means is if we call it uh, with the same inputs, it'll give us the same outputs every time. Uh, as I mentioned, there are other types of neural networks, uh, notably recurrent neural networks that have an internal state. And while those are deterministic, they'll always give you uh, a uh, response for a specific input. They won't give you the same response uh, because they have an internal state. Uh, Feed-forward uh, neural networks are idempotent because uh, they do not have any sort of internal state or anything that would modify the output. Great, so I think uh, there, there's one more question. Uh, and I'm not sure if I can, uh, if one of the other, um, uh, panelists could help me clean up some of the questions because I, I think I answered them. Uh, but the third one is about uh, optimization field to set the number of layers and neurons. Yes, so uh, that's a very active field of study called neural architecture search, and I hope we'll have time to talk about it near the end. Uh, but you can use lots of different methods for looking for the number of neurons uh, and types of layers, you can even use reinforcement learning for that. Uh, and that's a very active field of research. Okay, so uh, now that we have, oh wait, there is one more slide. Yes, uh, so congratulations to Hector and Gaitan. Uh, so there will be a leaderboard at the, end of, uh, at the end of all of these. So keep responding to the questions. Uh, so we're, we've got, a neural network, we can put many parameters in it. Uh, the question is how do we train those parameters in order to approximate the function that we want in order to maximize a certain objective that we want? Uh, how, how do we tune all of those weights and biases of the network? Uh, so just to, to get things working again, let's um, reinitialize the same network. All of this code is the same. From the last notebook, we've got our sigmoid function back. Uh, and here, this is the same forward pass, so there shouldn't be anything new. We've got, you know, an activation buffer, same network where we have the identity neuron at the end, and then the sigmoid neurons throughout. So um, no worries there. We're also going to have a big block of visualization code. So don't need to understand this code. Uh, and if it doesn't work for you, it's probably that you haven't installed network X. Uh, this is just gonna help us see the changes that we're doing to our network. And we can already go ahead and look at that. Uh, so here's what our network looks like, where the colors correspond to the different weights. Uh, and inside the nodes, they correspond to the, the biases. So. Uh, we're, we're just going to watch our, our neural network to see how it changes when we're modifying its weights. So let's say that uh, we're, we're giving our network a specific input. Uh, let's say that we're giving it uh, one, two. And we know that the value associated to that is 12.3. We want 12.3 as the output of our neural network. Uh, when we give it one, two. So what we can do is try to push the output of our network closer and closer to 12.3. Uh, now let's say we had a lot of points like that where we know what the inputs are and, and we know what the final uh, output that we, we want is. Uh, we can say that we've got all of those data points x, y, and now we're drawing them from a probability distribution P. We'll use those to change the parameters of our network. So in other words, that looks like this. We've got uh, theta 
is the vector of all of our parameters, all of the weights and biases. And the neural network is a function of those parameters, f of theta. Learning a neural network is just predicting the y uh, uh, to, uh, it, by finding the parameters that minimize this function. So we have uh, the output of our neural network minus the desired value y, which in this example would be 12.3 for when we're giving the function 1, 2 as input. So 1, 2 would be our x. So when the output uh, of our neural network minus y squared, so the squared uh, value, the L2 loss of the um, uh, of our output is low, that means that our network is closer to the prediction that we're hoping for. Uh, so we're going to go over all of our examples that we have, uh, all of the, the different x, y values, and we're going to integrate for all of these values, what is the difference between the output of our network and the real value square? Um, we are doing it as at least squares minimization. Uh, you could also use other loss functions that don't use the, the square term. But the idea is we're, we want to minimize the difference between the output of our network and the target value that we want. So let's make some points. We've got that one two point that we were discussing. We've got 1.1, 1 .1, 1 1.7, uh, and we've got 0 0.8, 1.9. The function that we're gonna try to approximate is square root of the first input plus the second input. So um, uh, we will look at how our random network does on that. Uh, so these weights were just set completely randomly. And we've got the values that we're hoping for here. So we've got 1, 2, and we want 1.73. Uh, but unfortunately, our network gives negative 0 0.13. So we're pretty far from the value that we were hoping for. And if we calculate this sum of the different squared, uh, here taking the, the average instead of the, the total sum, uh, we're going to get 3.3. And that's a measure of how far our network is from the point that we're trying to get it to arrive to. So uh, we're going to first look at a method called stochastic gradient descent, which is going to let us modify the parameters in the direction uh, of that loss function we looked at earlier. Let's say that we have an initial guess, uh, theta zero for the parameters of theta. How can we change this guess so that we minimize that loss of theta that we defined before? So again, we want to minimize this term here. If we were using plane gradient descent, so uh, if, if you're unfamiliar with, uh, with, with gradients, uh, if we are, are looking at the uh, gradient of that function and trying to move in the direction that minimizes it, uh, we would see that we want to move in the opposite direction of the gradient of the loss function with respect to theta. So we can write what that uh, would look like by first taking the gradient of this function. So here's our loss function. And here is uh, the, the form of it that we saw here. So the same thing. Um, and we're simply going to apply uh, the derivative to find what is the gradient of this function that we want to minimize. So the gradient of our loss function is the expectation of two times uh, the output of our network minus the y value times the gradient of our network. Uh, so, well, this is pretty easily calculable. 
uh, we we can take the difference between our output of our value and uh, uh, the the actual value, and we can multiply that by two. We're going to talk about this part next, which is the the taking the gradient with respect to theta of our neural network. Uh, but here is this same uh, gradient of the loss function written in other terms, which is going to help us with the next part. So what we note about this is that this is still an integral over the entire distribution of our data. Uh, and while that uh, is theoretically very nice, what this means is that we have to know uh, the entire distribution for all possible x, y pairs. That would mean that instead of having you know, the three examples that we generated, we have the entire distribution of the function square root of x plus x1. Uh, we have infinite examples that we could always get more of. Uh, we, we do not. We have a limited set of examples. Uh, and we would like to train our algorithm just using a limited set of examples. So what we're going to do is approximate the gradient. We're going to uh, use a limited number of examples, n, and just do a sum over those limited number of examples instead of the full integral. The theory of stochastic gradient descent says that if uh, g uh, uh, of theta, where theta are the uh, parameters of our network. So if there is some function g, which is a noisy estimator of the theta, uh, of the gradient of L of theta, then this sequence of updates to theta k converges to a local minimum of L of theta. Uh, there are certain conditions for that. We're going to look at those. But basically what this means is that we can use g of theta, which is our estimate of the gradient that we're going to get by doing a, a sum over only a little bit of the data in order to update the parameters of our neural network. So we've got uh, uh, the updates at one time step uh, based on the movement that we did in the gradient, in the estimation of our gradient. So the, what are these conditions? Uh, the first one is that the sum of all of these alpha values uh, is infinite, and that the sum of the alpha value uh, squared is less than infinite. What that means uh, basically is that uh, whenever the starting parameter uh, theta zero, uh, wh wherever that happens to be in the search space, uh, the procedure can reach it. Uh, and the second one uh, manages the step size that we have. These two are not super important to understand. Uh, we can go ahead and just define what our noisy estimator of the gradient is going to be, which is, again, the sum over all of our data uh, from i to, to n, however many data examples that we have. Uh, and we're going to use this definition of the gradient of our function two times the, dis, uh, the difference times the gradient of our neural network. So now we can use our data. We can apply this sum for the entirety of our three examples uh, and as soon as we pass through all of the data, uh, we're going to call that a training epoch for our neural network. We can do a little bit better than that in the real world when we're, uh, when, when we're dealing with real data sets, uh, because quite often uh, when we're applying deep neural networks, uh, we're going to be working with uh, data sets that are very large uh, with tens of thousands of, of points. And so while we could say, you know, maybe that gives us a, a full approximation of, of the gradient, uh, a better idea is to actually split that data up into small parts. And we're going to call those parts mini batches. Uh, and it is the same idea, but at a smaller scale. 
where if we do have tens of thousands of points, we don't need to use the entirety of the tens of thousands of points uh, to inform our gradient updates. It's going to be a lossy estimation at every uh, gradient update. So we can choose what size we use for that gradient estimation. And that is an important parameter in deep learning and it's called the batch size. How many examples are we using at each gradient step to calculate the gradient? So of course, uh, when uh, n is equal to one, when the size of our batch is just one, then our estimation of the gradient is incredibly noisy because we only have one point to sample. If n is uh, really huge, then the approximation of the gradient becomes much better. However, there is a computational cost behind that, which is uh, pretty important. So uh, usually you regulate the batch size based on your computational resources, uh, also on, uh, on convergence guarantees, especially in reinforcement learning, it seems like the batch size is a, a particularly prickly uh, hyperparameter. Um, but the, uh, the, the noise is not necessarily constant as you, uh, as you increase or decrease the, um, uh, the, the batch size. And oftentimes, it'll become a, a practical uh, question of, OK, how many samples can we actually put in the batch based on or GPU based on the hardware that we're using. So now we know how to move the entirety of the, um, the, the network towards a specific gradient or an estimation of a gradient uh, using stochastic gradient descent. However, there's one term in here which is still somewhat troublesome because we didn't talk about how to compute it. And it's this gradient with respect to theta of our function of the neural network. We don't have that yet. Uh, and so we needed another algorithm called back propagation, which is going to give us that information one layer at a time. So I'd like uh, you to keep this image in mind as we go through the next uh, slides, because there's quite a bit of math. Uh, and hopefully it will be more clear if we think about uh, the output of all of our neurons going forward in a forward pass. So we've got the, the, the outputs stored in, in Y and then Z uh, from our input layer, our hidden layer, our second hidden layer, on, and our output layer. We can store those at each time to say what was the activation, what was the input to the neuron, was the output to the neuron uh, based on its activation. And what we're going to do with backpropagation is go backwards through the network and send the gradient information at every step. So let's look a little bit more into detail in that. Uh, just to note that uh, uh, this algorithm to give the, the timeline a little bit of, uh, of deep learning. So we had the perceptron way, way before this. Uh, there were things in the 1960s which looked like backpropagation, but the first time it was used as a word was this 1986 paper, uh, and that is also really when it uh, was used a bit more. And this enabled training multi-layer uh, perceptrons uh, and, and deeper neural networks because uh, uh, you could take the error and, and train your entire network, not just a single layer. Uh, because of this backpropagation algorithm. So let's consider a neuron and we'll uh, name it J and its weights will be weight IJ. Uh, and we're going to say that we have X being the I input to this neuron, Y being the uh, input to the activation function. So the weighted sum of all of the, the inputs, but not yet the neurons output. That we're going to put into Z because we've also got the activation function that we have to calculate. So we compute these three quantities during the forward pass, of course. That's, that's how our neural network works. We, we compute uh, or we have X, then we compute Y, and then finally we compute Z. Uh, 
What we're going to do now, which is slightly different, is make sure we store that information so that we can use it on the backward pass. The important point to note in backpropagation is that the derivative of our neural network, f of theta, uh, with respect to this specific uh, uh, weight and input is that uh, it depends on the input to that neuron. So we can use uh, the, the gradient back at the uh, input level, the xij, um, and uh, sort of pass the gradient on from the z level back to the x level. Uh, if we're, we're using dj, uh, so this derivative here being the derivative uh, of f of our neural network, so f theta uh, with respect to z, so again, z being the output uh, of our neuron of x, so the derivative of this function, uh, times the activation, the, the derivative of the activation of the input. So this is the chain rule. Uh, and it's basically saying, OK, we can, we can do the derivative of, of this neuron if we can do the derivative of its activation function, and if we can pass the derivative then back on to, uh, uh, to, to the previous input. If that neuron is an output neuron, well, then it becomes easier because we can uh, just say, you know, that this part of the derivative is, is one. Uh, so for those neurons at the output layer, uh, we have uh, dj for free. We have uh, uh, just the derivative of the activation function. Once all of the uh, partials for the output layer have been computed, we can compute the partial for the last hidden layer uh, using that information. So we start by computing what is the partial at this neuron, because we have it for free pretty much, because the, um, the uh, derivative of our network with respect to that output is just one. Uh, so we can calculate the last layer. Once we have the output, well, then we can start calculating what, is, what are the gradients in the last hidden layer. Uh, so we have the partial with respect to j is the derivative of the activation function times the weighted sum of all of the partials uh, times their respective weights. So we're, go we're going to need to take the partials of all of the weights of the layers before, but we've already said, you know, what that can look like. Finally, we keep going with these uh, with the calculation of these partials until we get to the inputs. And the inputs is where we have information about you know what was the first input. That's where we can apply uh, a, uh, a a decisive answer to uh, the x i j part because we know exactly what the input to the neuron was. So we can then update the weights corresponding to the input neurons. Uh, we just move back through the network like that, uh, modifying the weights until we reach the input layer. Uh, and that constitutes one phase of backpropagation. So to take this picture uh, back again, uh, here's the uh, uh, a forward pass. So again, we're, we're saving the inputs and the outputs of all of our neurons. And then here's the backward pass where we first calculate what the partial is at our output layer. That gives us what the changes of the weight and the biases should be uh, for this layer here, uh, the second hidden layer. That lets us 
calculate what the partial at the second layer is, which then lets us calculate what the changes of the weight and the bias should be for the first in layer. And we keep doing that until we get to the very beginning. So that is the backpropagation algorithm. We're going to keep seeing it uh, uh, in a PyTorch example. So if it's not clear, I hope that uh, it becomes clear very shortly. Uh, so we have two phases of training our network. We have the forward pass, where we move all of the activation through the network, taking stock while we do that of what was the input to each neuron and what was the activation of that neuron. And then we have the back propagation part where we're going to take the difference starting from the output layer and then back propagate the gradient, uh, calculating the partials at each layer until we arrive at the input layer. Um, I am a little bit behind on time. So if the other panelists could feel free to answer some questions uh, in the uh, question and response, I'd appreciate it so I can get through this notebook more quickly. Uh, so we have uh, an example now of this backpropagation with this network in NumPy. And I hope that that'll clarify things for you if the backpropagation is still a little bit unclear. Uh, the first change that we have in the sigmoid function is that we're now saving its derivative. That's going to be useful uh, so that we can uh, uh, more easily calculate as we're doing the backpropagation, what was the derivative of our activation function at each time step. So we don't just have the output anymore. We've also got this derivative term. Uh, here's our forward pass. It's the same code as before. What we've changed is that we now have more buffers because we're going to be saving more information as we do our forward pass so that the calculation of the backward pass is faster. Uh, we could recalculate what was the activation at this, this time, but you'd have to go all the way back through the network much faster to save it when you do the forward pass so that on the backward pass, it, uh, uh, it's already there. Otherwise, this is the same forward pass as before. We're doing a dot product, we're adding our bias. Uh, we've got that uh, final neuron, which is a, uh, um, a identity neuron, and we've got all of our other sigmoid neurons. And here we're gonna be returning all of these state variables and not just the Y value anymore. So let's consider three examples. Uh, we've got uh, these three data points and uh, we're going to run them as if they are a batch. So here they are as our input data and we're just going to do a forward pass of that information. I can set that to true so we can see you know, what that looks like. Uh, and here we have all of our different outputs. Of course, now we have more information about the gradients than we did previously, uh, right? We can look at that gradient information and we can see, you know, now we know what the output activations were for all of our neurons during their forward passes. So that when we're doing the back propagation step and we need to use the uh, activation at that time in order to calculate what the partial was with respect to the activation, we've already got it. It's free. Here's the new part. Here's the backward pass. Uh, so we're going to first make a buffer uh, so that we can store all of our deltas as we're going through. Uh, and we've got the error, uh, which is the error at the final uh, end of our network. And that's what's going to kick off the back propagation because we need this first error in order to do all of the other ones. So uh, we go through the network, but you can see here that we're going backward through the network this time instead of going forward. Uh, first, we compute what the uh, delta is. And if we are in the end layer, then we have it for free. Uh, otherwise, this is where we do the 
uh, uh, the computation of the delta. Uh, this, what, once we've calculated what the delta should be, uh, what that uh, partial term is that, that we saw before, uh, we can multiply it by our error uh, and use that to update our weights. So here we have the weight, uh, the, the gradient for the weights calculated using this partial uh, and the gradient for the biases. The learning takes place here. Uh, this is where we actually update our weights and our biases. And this is the same alpha that we saw earlier uh, in the stochastic gradient descent. We're simply applying it at each layer uh, as we go through back propagation. But it is the, the learning rate. Uh, and if our gradient approximation is good, uh, we will converge to a local minimum in the loss that we've defined. So uh, let's, uh, let's, let's see if that works. Uh, just a note that this alpha parameter, we'll talk about it later, but it's, it's one of the important hyperparameters to remember about deep learning. All right, let's do a backward pass. So just by calling that, we did an update to the weights. We can see what the updates to the, to the weight looks like. Uh, we can see uh, certainly that the bias has changed uh, quite a bit, and there are a few weights that have also changed their values. What we can do is, is run it multiple times. Uh, it'd be better to do a forward pass so that we have new gradient information. Uh, but here, we're just going to keep applying the backward pass and seeing how the weights update based on this single backward pass. And they should con uh, converge to a similar update since we don't have new forward pass information. So here we go, where we've mostly saturated the changes. Uh, into uh, strong updates at this point. So uh, if you'd like, you can play with the updates in this notebook by doing multiple forward passes uh, and see how the weights of your network change over time. Uh, we're going to train the network now for uh, a, a more real training. Uh, and so in order to do that, we're going to reinitialize it, uh, reinitialize it with new weights and then look at the error as we go through multiple iterations of our data or epochs. So here is uh, the, um, uh, a loop of 500 different uh, epochs. Every time going through the entirety of the data, we only have three data points, so it's not very um, uh, big. Uh, and we can see that the the weight definitely does, uh, the error definitely descends to very small values. For our three data points, we should be pretty close to the function that we were hoping for. And we can see that, yes, for these three points, we are getting exactly what, we, what our uh, neural network is supposed to be getting. We're getting 12.3, 3.4, and 5.1. So we learned the weights and biases necessary to approximate the function for these three data points, not necessarily a function for the rest of the continuous space. We don't know uh, or have any guarantees about that, just for these uh, three pointwise mappings. Now let's try to actually learn a function. So we've got uh, x uh, and x1 going to the square root of x0 plus x1. That's the one we talked about at the beginning where we made some data for that. We're going to start with a new neural network again. And we're going to um, uh, try out our network on some uh, testing data. And so this is just the forward pass. And we can see that it's not doing very well so far. We've got an error of uh, 0 0.84. Let's see if we can train it to reduce that error. So we go. A thousand steps, and we're going to train it exclusively on the uh, the training data. We split the data in order to have some generalization, and uh, here we go with the training. So we see that very rapidly we got a low uh, error, and we've pretty much converged to a, a local minimum after a certain point. 
we can see if that local minimum was any good by testing it on some new data. So here we're just giving it some random values and asking it to, to predict uh, uh, the square root of x0 plus x1. Uh, it doesn't appear to be doing that very well. Uh, we've got, uh, you know, uh, 0 0.95, 0 0.93, 0 0.94. Uh, an exercise is to try a different architecture. Uh, I can do it real quick and see if that changes things. So now we have more neurons. And if we remember the uh, idea about uh, function approximation, having no more neurons should increase our neural network's ability to predict uh, different functions. And so here we can see that it is doing better in terms of function approximation. Uh, we're getting much closer to the values that we had hoped for. Hooray. Uh, OK, we're going to do one quick example in, in scikit-learn, uh, but we're going to do it very quickly so that we can pass on to deeper neural networks. Sorry that I'm sort of speeding through this example, but basically we're just going to be approximating x times sine of x. Uh, and that's what the function that we're approximating looks like. We're going to generate a bunch of random points around that uh, and use those points to train a neural network, which should then hopefully approximate this same function. So this is going to be a example of regression. And uh, just like the, the previous example we saw, so we're going to use scikit-learn's MLP regressor um, uh, type. Uh, we're giving it a rather large network with 100 uh, input neurons and then, and then 10 neurons. Uh, and we're using a type of optimization that we're not going to quite talk about uh, just because for this, uh, this problem, it, it ended up uh, working quite a bit better. Uh, so uh, that was the training loop for our neural network in scikit-learn, you call fit on models to, to fit them. And we can see what the network gave by calling predict. So here's the plot and we have in green our neural networks output uh, outputs and the, um, the original function in blue and of course all of the observations in red. So we can see that the neural network did very well learn how to approximate this function uh, pretty exactly. So uh, that's great. We have artificial neural networks filled with parameters that we can now tune uh, to get them to approximate a specific function if we want. Uh, next notebook, we're going to go deeper and talk about more modern neural, uh, uh, neural network architectures. But first, I have just a few questions for you all. So what information does backpropagation pass through the network? Neuron activations, gradient estimates, synaptic weights, loss function. Yes. So some of you were a little uh, tricked by the loss function. It isn't the loss function itself that is propagated through the network. It is the gradient estimates. Because of backpropagation, activation functions in the neural network should be And if they aren't, you have to find a way to get around it. That's maybe a hint. So we need them to be differentiable because we took the uh, derivative of the activation function as we were going through backprop. If we can't take the derivative of the activation function, we can no longer do backprop. Uh, and uh, that's... Uh, a problem when we talk about activation functions, we'll see how to get around that with the, the rectified linear unit. Stochastic gradient descent is guaranteed to converge to the global optimum. 
No, so we don't have a guarantee of convergence to the global optimum. We only have a guarantee of convergence to a local optimum. Uh, so that's good to keep in mind because uh, we might uh, want to jump out of the local optimum that we're in to go explore a different part of the, the search space. Uh, great. Let's go deeper with artificial neural network layers. I'll respond just quickly to the question, which is the fact that I use the LBFGS uh, solver. Uh, I welcome you to take that notebook and try out different solvers in the scikit-learn example. Um, but the regressor, the MLP regressor, does not train very well. Uh, and I'll also let Emmanuel answer that question. OK. Uh, we're going to use some pictures of clothes. So uh, this is a data set called Fashion MNIST, uh, and it's a classification task where we're going to try to classify 10 different classes of clothing using 60,000 examples. It is very similar to another large benchmark set called MNIST, which is digits between 0 and, and uh, 9. But this is a little bit more complicated because it's clothing. Uh, and we have what the different clothing types are here. Uh, you will need to download this if you're on your local machines. It'll do a, a downloading script there or, or on Colab. I've already got it downloaded. And then uh, here we're going to load in the data using Torch's prepared uh, data loader objects. Uh, I invite you to look in the documentation for how uh, how these work, but just note this is where we're setting that important hyperparameter of the batch size. Uh, and so in terms of our gradient estimate, the gradient estimate is set here. Uh, we'll also download the test data set, uh, and we will go through and get some examples. So this is what the data set looks like. We have these small images uh, with different labels of whether it's a shirt or a sneaker or a dress. So for the rest, for the half hour that, that rests, uh, we're going to make a neural network that classifies this, going first from small multi-layer perceptron type or, or two fully connected uh, layer artificial neural networks to, I hope, a convolutional neural network uh, by the end of the class. So this is the type of network that we've been using until now. Um, we called it a multi-layer perceptron. It's better to call it an artificial neural network if we're using different activation functions. And specifically, we have a name for these layers, which is fully connected or dense layers. Those are the two things that you'll, you'll hear them called. Uh, and you have in Torch, the linear function, which does those as well. I welcome you all to look at the Torch documentation as you're learning Torch, because it's very well done uh, and pretty comprehensive. So let's make a fully connected layer. We're going to use 784 as the size of our input, uh, because these images are 28 by 28, and that is 784 when you flatten it out. Uh, so this function x.view is just going to do that flattening uh, from 128.28 to 1.784. We could be using the spatial information of the fact that they're 28 by 28, and we'll see that uh, later. Uh, but right now, we're just going to flatten all the pixels one after another. What we're going to use now that we're in the classification case is the maximum output as our prediction. So we have 10 different neurons as the output. Whichever one of those has the maximum activation, we're going to say that that's the class of our, uh, uh, of our data. Uh, so we've got a random neural network. Let's see how it does. It doesn't do very well at all. Uh, because here we had a, a two, uh, and what we predicted was zero. It was a pullover, and we were predicting t-shirt slash top. Uh, not surprising. We have a, a random neural network. Uh, all of its parameters are completely new. It's not going to automatically give us a uh, perfect uh, accuracy on classification. Let's just double check that it's doing what we said 
these layers should be doing since the beginning, which is uh, wx plus b. So we've got um, uh, the input, uh, and we're just going to calculate it first using numpy, uh, this wx plus b. And then we're also going to calculate it using torch, and we're going to compare the two of them. We're going to see slight differences in terms of the floating point representation. Uh, and that's because they use different precisions uh, between torch and numpy, so that torch can be more uh, efficient when it's on the GPU. Uh, so yeah, we didn't do very well here. Uh, we've got, uh, uh, oh, sorry. Uh, we've got, <laughs> we're not classifying here. We're just taking the difference of these. So uh, it's, the, the difference between these is small enough that we can ignore it, but there is a difference. Uh, it's, uh, it's because of the floating point representation. All right, now that we've confirmed that that linear uh, layer does what we hoped it would do, let's make a little neural network. So let's have two fully connected layers like we've been having until now, and let's make a new forward function. I hope this forward function is much more digestible and, and understandable than our previous forward function. All we're doing is converting the input into that flat 784 array and then applying the fully connected uh, layers to it at each time we're reusing this x variable, and this is something that's pretty common in PyTorch, uh, just changing the value that is in this x variable, uh, and then finally returning it here. So uh, the output of fc1, x output of fc2. We're not saving the output of all of our neurons or the input to all of our neurons, and we'll see why we don't have to save those next. Uh, so let's just see, you know, uh, how it's doing, not doing any better, still a random network. Also note that we didn't have to say, well, draw the weights of this network from a normal distribution centered at zero with one. Torch does that for us, uh, just when we create an n dot linear or an n dot other, um, other type of network. Uh, a more proper way to make a network uh, is to use the nn.module class. Uh, and what that'll give us is two different methods. One that's going to be the constructor, where we set our, our weights, and then the forward pass already inside the, the network. So uh, this is the exact same network. We're just doing it in, in a more proper way by putting it in the nn.module. And we'll call it simple net because it is rather simple. Now that we have our network, we're ready to train it. Uh, but first, I'll respond to this question. Yeah, so uh, the question is about flattening the image and losing the important uh, spatial information of one pixel being next to another pixel. We are uh, not fully retaining that information. However, the network can still learn correlations between pixels, even if they're separate from each other in the input vector. The position inside the input vector doesn't matter very much or at all to fully connected layers. It's going to just have weights between uh, whichever uh, inputs it decides are more important based on the gradient information. Once we look at convolutions, we'll actually be able to take advantage of the uh, graphical information of pixel proximity. All right, uh, let's go back to backpropagation uh, and, and training. Uh, so we've been using Torch really similarly to NumPy, but we haven't had to store anything. Uh, and we're going to see that that's because of a big uh, advantage of using Torch and other deep learning frameworks, which is automatic differentiation. Let's see what that is. So first we need to talk about uh, what these, these objects are. Uh, we have in, uh, uh, in the different types of objects that we can represent, scalars, values, one, two, three, 
uh, vectors, so a, a one-dimensional list of scalars, matrices, a two-dimensional list, and tensors, which are n-dimension objects, scalars, vectors, matrices, are also tensors. It's just the general term. Uh, and so we're going to use the idea of a tensor as the core computational object for everything we do. At this point, uh, everything that we want to store is going to be a tensor. Uh, the inputs to our neurons are tensors, the outputs of our neurons are tensors, the gradients as we calculate them are tensors as well. And what we're going to do is link those tensors up in a computational graph, which is going to let us quickly do the forward pass and that backward pass. We can compare uh, the tensors uh, with numpy arrays and numpy matrices uh, to, to see you know, sort of how those compare. And for a, a tensor of the same dimensionality as, as one in numpy, they look pretty similar. Uh, but what is special about uh, deep learning tensors in TensorFlow or in any of the other frameworks uh, and definitely in PyTorch is that they keep track of gradient information automatically on the uh, on the tensor itself. So if you remember when we created our sigmoid function in the last notebook, we had to uh, say what the derivative of that function was as we were calling it. That sort of work is already done in deep learning frameworks and the gradient will be calculated if you ask for it for any of these tensors. So I think that is a response to your question, Mark. Uh, so here we have a require gradient. And now we can see uh, that we don't just have the, uh, the, the tensor for this y variable. Because we've called y dot backward, which is the way to ask for the gradient to be calculated, we have the gradient function, so the, the, the derivative uh, at y, already calculated. And what we can do is ask for dy dx automatically. So this is the, the, the power of uh, auto differentiation frameworks is that every time during forward pass or backward pass where we would have to keep track of uh, some information, whether that be uh, the, uh, the output of our, our neurons or uh, the activation or the gradient going back the other way. We already have that for free because all of the tensors have been made so that they store the gradient information next to them. Uh, so uh, there's an excellent tutorial uh, in the PyTorch uh, documentation about AutoGrad uh, and all of the other Frameworks use the same principle, but uh, PyTorch's auto differentiation is especially flexible and allows for uh, really easy manipulation of gradients. So we're going to use uh, auto differentiation to calculate the gradients of our neural network parameters because our neural network weights are already tensors and because the derivative of their uh, activation function of the, the sum of the weights is already calculated, uh, this will automatically perform back prop. So here we have uh, the uh, labels. Uh, we're going to call our network and then calculate the difference between our labels and the, uh, the one hot. Um, so uh, it is a numerical uh, gradient calculation. Uh, and to, to respond to that question. Uh, so we have the simple net, uh, the same network that we defined previously. And what we're going to do is just get the outputs of it, compare those to the labels, get the uh, square value of that to get the mean squared error. And that is going to give us uh, 
this, uh, this loss uh, tensor here, which we can use to calculate the output tensor. So this output tensor uh, has already the gradient on it that we needed to calculate for the first step of backprop. All that we need to do then for backprop is call dot backward on the entirety of our computational graph. So previously we called it just on a single function, uh, but it uh, can be applied for an entire chain of computations. What we need to make sure of is that there are no gradients hanging around that are already non-zero in, in, inside our neural network. Uh, so we just zero out the gradients before we go through and do uh, and do that. So what we can see, for example, is the gradient term on the bias in the second layer. Uh, before we do the backward pass, it's none. After the backward pass, uh, it has this value. And this is the derivative, the, the partial that we needed to calculate for all of those uh, uh, bias terms. So that's great because the, the bias update then is just one step away. So we've already got the partial. Uh, now we just need to multiply it uh, by the learning rate in order to do the weight update. So here is our, our weight update. Uh, and we just take the, uh, the gradient information and uh, apply a small change based on a learning rate to our existing parameters. We don't need to rewrite the entire SGD part of it though. Uh, Torch already has that as well. So we don't have to calculate at each step, you know, what is the, the, the gradient, uh, what is the loss. Uh, we have for example, cross entropy loss and SGD, which uh, will let us do those for free. Uh, we're going to increase the batch size just to make this run a little bit faster. So here's our new training uh, function. Uh, and we can already see I've increased the batch size to 512. That's quite large. The cross entropy loss uh, is a loss term that's uh, well suited for classification, uh, but I can't unfortunately go into the details on it. Here is where we set up what the final loss should be. So we're telling the, uh, the gradient calculation how we want our gradient to be calculated, notably that we're using stochastic gradient descent as the update for all of our uh, for all of our weight updates and bias updates, here's the alpha term that we're going to use. And this type of stochastic gradient descent also has a second term that, that we didn't see before, which is called momentum. Uh, basically inside the loop, we're going to get the data for our specific batch. We're gonna make sure that all of our gradients are zero for, uh, for our neural network from previous time steps. Then we're going to do a forward pass that's this. We're going to compare the output with the values that we want. Then we do a backward pass. So that's the backprop uh, step. And once we've done the backprop step, which is the computation of all of the gradients, then we can do our weight update step as well, because we'll have saved all of the, uh, the, the gradient updates through this backprop step uh, so that we can do the actual weight update. Uh, and this is just uh, to, to store what our training loss was. So we're going to use the same network and uh, do a uh, simple training of this simple net. Uh, so this is a single epoch. We went over the data once uh, and we have a fairly high training loss. However, the loss uh, isn't very informative as a metric. So what we're going to do first is split a set of the data into a validation set. Uh, and we can look at the accuracy of our model using that validation set. So here we use all of the predictions on that validation set uh, by running them through our network. And the accuracy is very low. Uh, so it's, it's only 0.48. Uh, we're, we're going to try to improve that, uh, but uh, I 
am unfortunately going to have to skip through rapidly on this activation function section. Uh, but basically, we've been using uh, standard uh, linear layers with no activation function. We're going to try applying now a sigmoid, and we see that our accuracy actually goes way down. Instead of a sigmoid, which we've been using mostly for theoretical purposes now, we're going to look at another one called rectified linear unit, where uh, uh, the gradient of the function is going to be better for learning. Because the gradient of the sigmoid function, as displayed here, has one problem. When we multiply things by this gradient, they're going to diminish over backpropagation. Every time we multiply by the gradient, uh, the values are going to be capped to around 0.2 just because of the nature of the derivative of the sigmoid function. It's always capped at these low values. What that means is every layer, the gradients get smaller and smaller, which means our weight update and the potential for our weight update gets smaller and smaller. This is known as the vanishing gradient problem, and it's a pretty big uh, issue if you're just using sigmoids, but an easy fix for it is to use the rectified linear unit. Uh, and so this is the rectified linear unit. Uh, it is a non-continuous uh, or non-continuously di uh, differentiable function in that we're just taking the maximum of zero or x as our function. However, we can sort of cheat for x equals zero uh, and define the derivative as this, which is if the value of x is greater than zero, that is the, the, um, the derivative. Uh, so you can cheat at the zero point in ReLU uh, to make it a continuously differentiable function saying that either the derivative is zero or one at that point, but the main advantage of the ReLU uh, uh, derivative is that it is either zero or one. And if it's one, then we're not going to have our gradients vanishing on us. Uh, we're going to apply ReLU and we suddenly have a slightly better accuracy but it's not yet great. I only have 13 minutes, so I'm going to rapidly go through convolutions, uh, but hopefully I'll have time at the end to leave the uh, poll open so that you guys can respond to some more questions. Really sorry that I'm having to rush through things here. Uh, so uh, now we're going to get to one of the big blocks of uh, uh, neural networks and one of the things that have really let them be applied uh, anywhere that you uh, have images or, or sort of spatial information uh, is convolutions. Um, this is the basic idea of how convolutions uh, work. Uh, we're going to apply a filter of a certain size, so here four by four by three, over the entirety of our input and taking uh, the values from that filter, it's going to construct the output in the next layer. So we, we slide this filter over our image. Uh, it can be in, in different dimensions and we can use different paddings uh, is sort of the space that we apply that filter for. And the weights that we're going to tune now are going to be the parameters of that filter rather than parameters for the entirety of the network. The uh, secondary operation, which is going to help convolutions a lot, is called pooling information. Here we see a max pooling operation where you take uh, the um, largest value in specific sectors. And what that means is that if you have a feature detector, which is sliding over your entire image, and then you have a max pool layer after that, or an average pool layer, what you're hopefully going to be getting is some sort of detection of a feature in a localized area of the, the image. Uh, for example, if you're trying to distinguish between cats and trees, were there ears in the picture? Is there a filter that corresponds to ears and did it detect something? If so, there might be a large positive signal that you can pick up with a max pool layer here. These uh, convolution operators are also translational. Uh, they have translational invariance, which means uh, you can have a feature appearing in different parts 
of an image and the network will still detect it. So here is a, is a simple example. Unfortunately, can't respond to the question about max pooling not being differentiable, uh, but just like Relu, there are tricks for when things are not continuously differentiable. Uh, so we're uh, going to define a convolutional layer and the uh, one of the big parameters for that is, of course, the kernel size, what we saw in the first image of how big is this window that we're sort of sliding over all of our, um, all of our inputs. But even more important is how many different sort of features do we want to try to detect? Because what we're going to do is compress the image in one dimension, uh, make it smaller in, in the input size if we were having 28 by 28 neurons before, we're going to pass a three by three filter over them. That's going to reduce it. But what we're hoping to do is detect a lot of different features. Uh, and those we're going to call channels. Uh, there's a wonderful illustration on this page of the, all, all of the different uh, 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 different parameters that you can pass in to a convolution. So stride, padding, dilation, groups. Uh, if you'd like to know what those are, there are wonderful uh, illustrations of them here. So for example, what padding plus stride looks like. Uh, I'm going to pass quickly just to the definition of our network. So here, as we had before, we have a uh, 32, uh, we have a two layer network. Uh, we're using the nn.module. Uh, we have this constructor method and our forward pass. All that we've changed is that we have these two new convolutional layers. We're going to be using 32 channels, three as the kernel, then going larger to 64 channels, hoping to look for things in those 32 channels that we can split up into different features and then uh, transferring them into linear uh, layers for the final output. Uh, so uh, we also have max pooling layers that we're going to apply at the end of every convolutional layer. The reason that we don't declare those here is because they're non-parametric. Uh, the max pool layers don't have anything to initialize. They don't have weights or biases. Uh, they're just sort of in the same line as activations on our other uh, uh, functions. So we only apply them in the forward pass, whereas the init method is for the construction. Uh, so here we're going back to our training method and we're going to uh, simply train that new convnet and see how it does on a, uh, on, on this fashion MS. Uh, we're only training it for one epoch, but we don't do very well. We did reduce the batch size again. Uh, so our estimation of the gradient is very, very lossy, but we're at lower than 30%. It'd be really great to improve this. Uh, so we're going to look at one last thing before we go, uh, which is optimization methods. So until now we've used SGD. We saw SGD with momentum, but it was sort of hidden. Uh, and what we're going to use instead is a different method called Atom. So SGD uh, is optimizing this function uh, and it's doing it by this weight update. And here we have uh, the uh, momentum uh, term. Uh, so that's... Uh, that's where this momentum comes in from. Uh, the, the definition of Q is here. Uh, and so we have two hyperparameters to deal with. We have the, the learning rate and the, the rate of momentum. Uh, and we can see that those hyperparameters have a pretty large effect on where our neural network ends up. Uh, it might push us over to one side or, or another if there are two local minimum that are pretty close. And it also changes drastically how close, how, how quickly we approach those local minimum. We're going to look at a different method though, which has uh, average of past gradients for two different reasons. Uh, we're going to use the average of past gradient first to, uh, to 
uh, create momentum similar to the Nesterov momentum that we had in SGD. And then we're going to use the uh, pass squared gradients to avoid diminishing learning rates. Uh, so the full atom method is written here. And it has new hyperparameters. It has betas uh, and a epsilon, uh, and of course the same learning rate. As with SGD, the uh, the choice of hyperparameters is uh, very important. But the local convergence guarantee still holds. We're going to get to one of these local minima if we run the algorithm for long enough. All right, uh, with five minutes to spare, we have Adam, we have, uh, uh, oh, and I didn't even use it. Huh. Uh, well, we'll use it right now uh, and see how it does. I hope it does well. And we're going to go for 20 epochs. Uh, so this time we're actually going to train for a little bit longer. I'm going to uh, start that a training. We're also increasing the batch size again so that we have a uh, better estimation of the gradient. Uh, and while that's a training, uh, the first question uh, that I see, why did I go from a smaller to larger size on the convolutional layers, but the opposite on the dense ones? So. In the first pass of a convolution, you're trying to gather uh, big features uh, that might be about what the image looks like um, and might not be very fine in detail. You then apply a convolution to those features in hopes that you're going to detect really features that are going to help you classify at the end. Uh, it's not that the network is necessarily larger at that point, but when you get to dense layers, then uh, you might have to have a relatively large dense layer in order to feed that information back into uh, a final classification. What you can do to avoid that is keep adding convolutions and nmax poolings, uh, but uh, for fashion MNIST, having a relatively large uh, linear layer in the middle does end up working out. Not a very satisfying answer. I did see a question about darts earlier, which disappeared. I'd be happy to respond to any question about neural architecture search in, uh, in the matrix chat. Uh, but in general, there are multiple ways to use uh, uh, automatic optimization tools, including gradient descent, to decide what architecture to use. I see Emmanuel popping back into uh, the Zoom. And so I think my time is up. Uh, I'll just let this finish its training and see if we got a network that does okay. It looks like Adam was effectively not the best. Yes. Well, sometimes when you change a hyperparameter during a dem uh, demonstration, things don't go as planned. So Emmanuel, is this uh, is this the end? Have a couple now? of minutes. I I just was intervening concerning that Dart question. It's waiting for you in the matrix chat. So we started answering, but you are the one to answer there. Great. Uh, yes, uh, I'll be happy to respond to any question about Darts in the matrix chat. Uh, and I hope that there might even be uh, my PhD student uh, who's working on Darts in the matrix chat to respond to questions as well. If we have, I asked her, I asked her if she could answer that. <laughs> if we have a second uh, before the next talk starts, I would like uh, this, the, the participants to be able to answer these questions. Go for it, and then we will conclude. Thanks. So in image processing, what input do we consider for an ANN? Are we looking more at scalars, vectors, matrices, or tensors? Ah, I actually should have 
said yes to vector. Apologies for, for those who said vector because we can flatten the input. Uh, but in any case, tensor is correct always because all of these are tensors. What uh, should we use deep learning libraries like PyTorch for? What, what's really the advantage of these sort of libraries? Great, so we have efficient ten tensor representation. We have automatic differentiation, which is auto uh, already packaged in for us. And we also, something we didn't talk really about is that they, they allow us to compute on GPUs, which are going to do all of the back propagation matrix multiplications much faster than on CPU. What is the problem with the sigmoid activation function? And while you're all responding to that, we'll get better results. Great, vanishing gradient. Uh, it's not vanishing or vanishing activation. And last question on the third notebook, and then I think uh, I think that that's that's good enough because there are other questions, but uh, I think I've on as much over time as I can. Yep, so the main advantage of the ReLU function uh, is that it is uh, zero or one uh, for its gradient, uh, but there are problems with the ReLU function as well and those are detailed in the notebook. Uh, so uh, who won the leaderboard? Uh, congratulations to Hector. And thank you all for participating and, and listening to the talk. I look forward to seeing you in other parts of the RLVS and, uh, and responding to uh, all of your questions on Matrix.